Hello. You're about to hear from a Harvard health expert, well-published, well-known, who thinks like a smart, enterprising journalist. Dr. Anapan Jena, best known as Bapu, asks the questions that aren't being asked. He delves deep into science and economics, and he comes up with some unexpected and provocative answers that speak to how we live today. Bapu has both an MD and a PhD in economics. He's a practicing internist, and he still sees patients at Mass General. He is a prolific writer. He produces much quoted articles in the most prominent medical journals. And yet, he's very different than many of the health policy experts that I've talked to over my career. And I'm a proud member of the uh, Neiman class of 2000. Yay. And I was telling them last night how surprised I was at how he understood journalism. And in fact, he surprised me by drawing a direct line between his own you know, esteemed academic research and journalism itself. He told me the key ingredient is to have the idea. A good journalist writes well, tells a good story, but most important, knows what story to tell. And I'll leave him to explain how that works. Thank you. Can you, all, can you all hear me in the back? All right, um, so I, I'd like to make this a little bit different and make it uh, interactive. And so the success of this next 10 minutes will depend on you chiming in. You sound like a vocal bunch, so I don't think it'll be, uh, be difficult. But I want to draw a, a, a line between the type of work I do and what I think makes for good journalism. And that's about telling a story and coming up with questions uh, that people want to know answers to. Uh, either because they just, they, they've just they always wanted to know the answer to a certain question or they never even thought that that was a question that was worth answering. Uh, and that's a lot of what I do, is try to come up with these interesting types of questions. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those uh, today. But one of the most difficult things is coming up with these ideas in the first place. And that's what I want us to do together today. Does that sound okay? And if you participate, I'll give you a surprise at the end. Okay? All right, so what is this a photo of? All right, that's the easy question. Now, I'm going to turn it over to you. Tell me some ideas. What's the first idea that comes to mind? You could say, all right, I want to see whether or not people who wear Nike shoes have faster times than people who wear Reebok shoes. And literally anything. In fact, just use the word marathon. It could be, what's the effect of watching a Harry Potter marathon on you know, eating Ben and Jerry's? I don't know. Anything. So just look at this photo. Give me an idea. Just yell it out. How quickly do your knees blow out? How <laughs> How quickly do your knees blow up? By the way, who's run a marathon? Who's thought about running a marathon but said this is a really bad idea? Okay, all right, good, 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 good. Uh, okay, so how quickly do your knees blow out? You know, uh, let me push that even further. What, what are the long-term health effects of running a marathon? You know, it turns out that if you look at marathon runners and you measure their blood when they run a marathon, the levels of cardiac enzymes go up just like in a heart attack. So running a marathon obviously is not a normal thing to do, uh, and it's definitely not a normal thing to do for your heart. But you could then imagine, like, if I look at these people 20 years later, do they have higher rates of scar in their heart and higher rates of arrhythmias? So abnormal heart rhythms. Now, the problem with that kind of study is that you know what you're going to find. People who run marathons are healthier. So they're actually going to have better long-term health outcomes. So we're not in a situation where we can really randomize people to run marathons and run by people to not run marathons and then follow them out over their lives and see how their health outcomes differ. But it turns out in reality you might do that. So for instance, New York had a marathon that was canceled several years ago because of bad weather. If I knew the names of people who were registered to run that marathon uh, and wanted to run that marathon but for this completely random event happened not to, I could look at 60 day or 6 month mortality rates from heart attack for those people who were supposed to run the marathon, but for, again, for a random reason, didn't. And that's what we call a natural experiment. So that's not the idea I had in mind. What else? One more. How many different t-shirts are there? How many different t-shirts are there? Okay. All right, how about for the next eight minutes, you count and tell me what happens at the end. <laughs> All right, how many different t-shirts are there? All right, that's a good question. Now focus on this photo. Now think, think about the streets that are adjacent to this photo. 
Are they going to look empty or busy? They might look empty. And in fact, if no one said empty, I would have just said that I heard someone say empty. Okay. So the streets would look empty. Now, what ideas come to mind now? There are streets that are empty next to this busy photo. Impact on business, good. What else? What, who said traffic? Don't be shy. OK, so what about traffic? Oh, good. So rerouted traffic. Now, remember, my background is in medicine and economics. So let's now focus the ideas on, on rerouting of traffic. Say it again. Exhausted emissions. OK, what else? Stress. Oh, people are dying. Oh, you're so morbid. Come on, man. Jeez. <laughs> All right, so a few years ago, my wife ran a race called the, the Race to Remember. Uh, it starts in the seaport area. It goes uh, through Beacon Hill, which is where Mansion Hill Hospital is located, which is where I work. She asked me to come watch her along the race route because it was her first time uh, running a race. And so I drove down Storo Drive, was going to get off at um, the MGH exit to park there and watch her. And I couldn't get off the road. I couldn't get off the exit because it was blocked because of the race. So I drove back home. A few hours later, she, she says, oh, gee, what happens to people who need to get to the hospital during a marathon with all these roads closed? And I thought, that, that's a really interesting idea. We've got 26 miles or more of roads being closed. Any of you who've lived in a city that's hosting a marathon know it's a real pain to get anywhere on marathon day, particularly in, in this city. So what do you observe? So we, we looked at data from Medicare. Medicare is insurance for the, for the old. We had data on all people in Medicare who are hospitalized in the US hospital. And we looked at 10 cities that hosted marathons over 10 years. And this was published in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a, a big medical journal. It came out just a few days before the Boston, uh, Boston Marathon. And what we found was that if you are hospitalized with a heart attack or cardiac arrest on the day of a major US marathon, your mortality rate goes up by about 15% relative to the surrounding days. It's that orange line, relative to the surrounding week. So if Boston happens on Monday, we look at the subsequent three or four Mondays and the preceding three or four Mondays, and you find a 15% increase. You don't find any changes in areas that surround the marathon route but that are not directly on it. So these are people whose homes are along the marathon route. And these are not runners. These are older Americans. These are people who are unlikely to be running marathons but happen to have a heart attack or cardiac arrest on the day of a marathon and quite possibly can't make it to the hospital in time because in these kinds of conditions, time matters. All right, so that's, that's, one, that's, that's what we find. How would you show that this is true, that this is about delays in care? What kind of data would you need to show that? Oh, my goodness, you guys are doing my job for me. You're like running a clinic here. Okay, all right. Ambulance response time. So we were lucky enough to be able to get ambulance response times from these cities over this period of time. And what you can see in this orange line is that ambulance transport times, they go up about 20 to 30 percent on the days of marathons. And, and do you expect them to be higher in the morning or the evening or both? Morning, because the roads are closed in the morning. And lo and behold, if you look in the evening, the line looks flat. So there's no increase in ambulance transport times in the evening, only in the morning when the roads are closed. So you know, what we basically find is that during a major marathon, mortality rates go up for people who are not running marathons. Now, the purpose of this study is not to say that we shouldn't hold marathons or that, who was it that mentioned Taylor Swift? Someone said, someone talked about Taylor Swift or, or that we shouldn't hold Taylor Swift concerts because we worry about these kind of negative spillover effects related to traffic and so forth. But, Keep in mind here that the number of people who we would project to die in Boston in any given marathon because they can't get to the hospital in a timely fashion actually exceeds the number of people who died in the Boston Marathon bombings. And so this is a public policy point about how do we think about public health and emergency preparedness around these events. We focus on people who are at the events, but we never think about the people who might live around those areas but can't get to the hospital in time because of, uh, because of delays in care. All right, that's one example. We have one more and then it'll stop. What is this a photo of? It's a conference. Conference for who? 
Like you said cardiologist, like you have something against cardiologists. <laughs> what, what, are, you, are you a dermatologist or? <laughs> All right, okay. What ideas come to mind? They are predominantly male. That is correct. Good. Okay, so you could say what? You know, how? What's the fraction of cardiologists are male, and how has that changed over time? Right now, we're about a third female. What else? Oh, there are a lot of white white people there. That's correct. That is that's accurate. That's. You know, to be honest, this is quite surprising to me. I'm Indian, and, and at MGH, probably a third of the cardiologists are Indian, so I, this is not a representative photo, clearly. So, uh, All right, what else? Drug money. Drug money, okay. So uh, you see an, an ad there for Repatha. Repatha is a, a new drug to treat uh, high cholesterol. Uh, you might say, all right, let's look at rates of prescribing of Repatha in the weeks after this meeting, because clearly it's being uh, advertised very heavily. We've actually looked at that. We don't see any increases in, in, in rates of Repatha prescribing after the meeting. What else? Mortality rates for all the doctors. Mortality? All right, what do you say? Okay. <laughs> Gentleman in the front says mortality rates when all the doctors at the conference. All right, so let me get a raise of hands. Do mortality rates go up or go down? Who says up? Okay, up because all the cardiologists are out of town and it's difficult to get care. Makes sense, right? All right, who says down? Oh, okay, only, all right, so we have a representative sample of 10 people who voted, <laughs> half, half. So it turns out that mortality rates fall, all right, they fall. So these meetings are attended by a lot of people, okay, about 15,000 people attend these meetings every year, about eight to 10,000 cardiologists attend these meetings uh, every year. And patients don't know when these meetings are happening, okay, <laughs> obviously, they don't know when these meetings are happening. But why is that useful for me? It's useful for me because this creates a very nice natural experiment. A person has a heart attack, they have cardiac arrest, they're taken to the hospital. They don't know what the environment in the hospital is going to be that day. It happens to be in the middle of November or middle of March when these major uh, cardiology meetings uh, are being held. And what happens? If you have cardiac arrest, the, the, the normal trajectory of someone with cardiac arrest is as follows. If you go to the hospital and you had cardiac arrest at home or somewhere else, you have a 70% chance of being dead within 30 days of that hospitalization. So it's just a serious condition, okay? Even heart attacks, high-risk heart failure, we're talking about 20 to 25% of these people are dead within 30 days of getting to the hospital. For cardiac arrest, if you are hospitalized on the dates of a major cardiology meeting, your mortality rate falls from 70% to 60%. That's a 10 percentage point increase. Now, is that large or small? I'll, I'll tell you this. If you take all the interventions that cardiologists have at their disposal to date, that mortality effect, if you sum up all those things, is less than 10 percentage points. So everything that we do now in cardiology, whether it be stenting, aspirin, beta blockers, new, heart, uh, new cholesterol medications, whatever it is, it's not as impactful as this right here. So we're talking about a 10 percentage percent point reduction in mortality if you happen to go to the hospital when cardiologists are out of town. Now, why would this be the case? I mean, this, like, if you think this should be the reverse, right? I mean, really good cardiologists, leaders in cardiology are at this meeting. We would expect outcomes to be worse. Now, why might they be better? Less risky interventions. Less risky interventions. So suppose I were to, and one more question, yeah. Yeah, so it could be that the, the composition of people who is there is different. So maybe the people who remain behind are the ones who see a lot of patients as opposed to the people, okay, the people like me who don't see patients as often, and outcomes could be worse. And those are the ones who are going to the convention. That's possible. It could also be that there's a change in the number of risky procedures that are performed. So suppose I told you that the rates of stenting of the heart fall by about a third, a third, if you have a heart attack during the dates of these meetings. That's a large reduction. Now, how might that actually benefit patients? Let me give you two examples. So one is a 40-year-old guy. He's a contractor, no medical problem. He smokes, but no other medical problems. He's working on the site. He develops chest pain, and he is brought into the hospital. Uh, in the ED, they do an EKG, like a real one, not on an Apple Watch. They do a real EKG, okay? And uh, it shows a particular type of heart attack has occurred. He gets rushed to the catheterization lab, he gets a stent, he's discharged in two days, he lives a fine, happy, normal life. Take a 90-year-old woman, 
develops chest pain at her nursing home. She's on 10 different medications. She gets taken to the emergency department. She has the exact same EKG, exact same blood test. So she's having a very similar looking heart attack. She gets taken to the cath lab. She gets a stent, but she dies within two weeks because of complications of the procedure. That, that's not a, a difficult story to imagine, and I imagine that some of you would have family members or friends who have fallen into that category where, where an unintended consequence happened for medical, for medical care. And the idea here is that often when we, when we practice medicine, there are black and white cases where we know what the answer is. But there's a lot of area where, where we're in the gray, where we think we know what we're doing and we, we hope what we're doing is right, but we may not be doing what's right. And this is a way to use big data, an interesting natural experiment, and an observation that I had as a, as a resident of how care looked differently during the dates of these meetings to try to understand better what works and what doesn't work in medicine and who are the patients who we are helping and who are the patients that we might be, might be harming. All right, I have, let me, let me do this actually. I'll, I'll give you one more example uh, just from work we're doing now and then I'll stop with something else. $3.99. Why do stores charge $3.99 for an item instead of $4? Because people, people are more likely to buy the item for $3.99 than they are to buy for $4. And, they, and they're, they're increasing that in their likelihood of cons buying that item is much more than that penny difference. So that's called left digit bias. Behavior economists refer to this as left digit bias. You focus on the left digit, the three versus the four. How much you apply that to, to a cardiologist who's seeing a patient in the, in the emergency department? Any ideas? Focus on the age of the patient. So let's say you got a, 69, six, a, a guy who's 69 years old in 50 weeks versus 70 years old in two weeks. Do you think the cardiologist might look at those patients differently? I mean, they're only four weeks different in age. Why might a cardiologist look at those two patients differently? Yeah, the bias, the left digit bias. They may focus on the six, and they say, oh, this 69.9 year old man, this is a 60 ish year old guy. The 70.1 year old person, this is a 70 ish year old person. As it turns out, the older you, you are, the less likely doctors are want, want to do procedures on you. So if you look at people who are, who are basically the same age, but who are only separated by essentially two weeks, but one person has their age begin with the six, one person has their age begin with the seven, there's about a 10 to 15% difference in the likelihood of getting a stent. The 69.9 year old person is about 10 to 15% more likely to get a stent than the 70.1 year old person. Now what's the next question you want to know the answer to? Who lives? So what do you think? Is there a difference in mortality between these groups? So let's say, who says there's no difference in mortality? And who says that because the 70.1 year old person is not getting a stent, they are actually more likely to die? Oh, so it turns out that there's actually no difference in mortality. So what this suggests is, again, this is a natural experiment that relies on biases that we have as individuals uh, that shows that at least 10 to 15 percent of what we're doing in terms of stenting people isn't, isn't actually impactful. It doesn't affect patient outcomes. So um, I want to end with this. I, uh, I told Deborah, depending on whether or not you participated, I would do something uh, different uh, at the end. So um, bear with me. I, I know I put you in the hot seat. So, anybody know sign language? Oh, good, perfect. Uh, I just, I just, I just uh, narrated the Bible. No, um, I put you in the hot seat, and so I felt it's only right to, for me to, to to do the same for you. So, uh, about a year ago, we have two kids. About a year ago, our son Aiden uh, was born deaf in both ears. Uh, my wife, who's also a physician, she's a radiologist at Brigham Women's Hospital, which is one of the large teaching hospitals in the Harvard system. Uh, she has really been a force to, for us to learn American Sign Language. And why? So our hope is that one day 
through education and our support, he can be in a room like this, sitting with people like you, doing what he loves uh, love to do. And so the title of this talk was to think differently, to be open-minded, to be creative. And my hope is that you all do that and to give people the chance who otherwise you wouldn't think about giving a chance to. So, thanks.